Great. In this video, we've got an example of adverse selection, so you can see how that plays out in a real market. Okay, so this is a really classic example. Um, the first paper about this problem by Akerlof uh, used this example, used cars. Um, so you'll see that referenced fairly often. Um, you may know Akerlof is a Nobel Prize winning economist and uh, happens to also be married to Janet Yellen. So um, anyway, we've got here an example in the used car market. Suppose that all used cars are either good or bad, and we'll call the bad ones lemons. Um, if we have a good used car, then it's worth $10,000 to the buyer, but a lemon is only worth $5,000. Now, the lemons also have a lower value to the seller. The seller values a good used car at 9,000, but a lemon is worth only four. You can see that the buyer values the cars, both of them, more than the seller. So there are potential gains to be trade, gains from trade. There are potential gains from trade um, for both good cars and lemons. The problem is we have asymmetric information. The person who owns the car knows whether it's good or bad, but potential buyers can't tell the difference. Everybody knows that 80% of used cars are lemons and only 20% are good. So let's start by thinking about if that's true, if 80% of used cars are, are lemons, then how much would the buyer be willing to pay for a used car? Well, the expected value of the car would be, um, Eighty percent times five thousand. This is the value to the buyer. The seller knows which is which. And twenty percent times ten thousand. Right. If I bought a used car at random, then. 80% of the time I would get a lemon, 20% of the time I would get a good one, and um, my total expected value would be 6,000. So the buyer is, even if not risk averse, the risk neutral buyer is willing to pay up to $6,000 for a used car. Okay, what's the problem? Well, the seller is not willing to sell a good car for less than $9,000, right? So the seller not willing to sell a good car for less than 9,000. What does that mean? It means that if you're selling cars, you're only selling lemons, right? Only lemons will be for sale on the used car market. And after a while, buyers may begin to expect that all used cars are lemons because they observe that every time they buy a new car, it turns out to be a lemon. and they lower their willingness to pay for a used car to their value of a lemon, which is $5,000. So you can see how adverse selection negatively affects insurance markets here because we have potential gains from trade for good cars, right? 
buyer is willing to pay 10,000, the seller is willing to pay, willing to accept 9,000, but that transaction cannot take place because of this asymmetrical information. And so um, in insurance markets, what's happening, say in health insurance, is that we have high willingness to pay consumers who are likely to be sick. And we have low willingness to pay consumers who are likely to be healthy. And the high willingness to pay consumers are definitely going to buy insurance. And this pushes premiums up. The, some of the low willingness to pay consumers may opt out of buying insurance. The insurance company can't tell who is who, right? Um, and so they set premiums based on the risk pool. But as more and more young, healthy people opt out of buying health insurance, premiums rise for everyone, pushing more younger, healthier people out of the market, increasing premiums again. Um, and um, this is unfortunate because even young, healthy people can benefit from buying insurance to reduce their risk. So um, this is one of the big problems in insurance markets. And, and one, to, one way that, that the Affordable Care Act tried to address this was to require everyone to purchase health insurance or pay a penalty. Um, but there are other ways to address problems of asymmetric information. One is to improve access to information. And in the example of health insurance, this might mean statistical discrimination. Right? We might need health exams in order to get health insurance. But part of the purpose of health insurance is to give people um, who need health care um, a lower cost. So it's not just avoiding un unforeseen risk, but also kind of risk pooling over our lifetime. The thing is that at some point in time, most of us are young and healthy. And at some point in time, most of us are old and sick in need of more health care. So, um, and certainly birth is one of the most expensive, birth and death are the most expensive events in life. Um, and there's something that happened to, happens to everyone, right? So um, we may not at any point in time need to buy health insurance, but we probably will need health insurance at some point in our lives. So in some sense, health insurance allows you to spread the cost of your health care over your lifetime, um, not just over individuals, but for one individual over time. Um, and so we don't want to just kick all the expensive sick people out of the insurance market. Um, at any point in time, what we'd like to do is to um, give people an incentive to be healthy, but at the same time guarantee that health insurance is available. In the used car market, you can see how improving access to information is useful because you could say solve this problem if the buyer just simply was able to gain more information about the type of car that's being offered by taking the car to the mechanic or getting a car fax or whatever uh, information about the car from an objective source that's not the seller. Um, and that would solve this problem of asymmetric information. Um, in health insurance, we have other options, right? We can have group policies, which um, means that instead of insuring individuals, you insure groups um, and that will lower premiums um, for individuals as everyone in the group um, right, is required to be in, right? So employer-sponsored health insurance is one way to do that for people who don't have insurance through their employer. The Affordable Care Act established marketplaces that allow for community-rated health insurance. So you're in a group basically with everyone else who lives in your rating area, which encompasses usually like a city or a county or something like that. Um, another way that I want to go into a little bit more detail here about uh, that we can solve this problem is, is to use signaling. So um, if you can send a signal about the type of uh, product you have um, and that signal is credible, then um, you will be able to solve this asymmetric information problem. So sellers of good used cars would like to say, hey, this is a good one, right? Pay more for it. The problem is that sellers of bad used cars will also try to say, this is a good one. You should pay more for it since the buyer can't tell the difference. But if there's a way to credibly signal that you have a good car and the buyer should be willing to pay more for it, then this can solve the asymmetric information problem. 
So for example, in the car market, we can say, offer a warranty. So say that lemons are more likely to break down and that um, the owners of lemons then would not be as willing to offer a warranty for their car uh, as owners of good cars, right? So, so say that owners of good cars would be more willing to offer a warranty where they would cover damages um, on the car for the first, say, two years. So this only works if the signal is costly for the lemons. Okay, in this case, the gain from selling a lemon as a good car would be $6,000. That's a big incentive to lie and say you have a good car. So in this case, the cost of the warranty would have to be um, large. More than $6,000 for owners of lemons. but it would have to be small for owners of good cars. The gain of selling a good car is only $1,000. And so the warranty would have to be less costly for good cars. It would have to be less than thousand dollars. But if we have a signal that's expensive enough for owners of lemons and less expensive for owners of good cars, then this can be a credible signal that um, allows us to correct the problem of adverse selection in this market. That's the end.